All right, should be good to go. Uh, Miles, you said? Again, um, double click on Miles to watch his stream. Because he's got, um, what's it called? Uh, PowerPoint set up for this. Yeah, we've got a slideshow set up. Uh, I can hear you. I think we're going to start here in just a couple minutes. Mm -hmm. Just so everybody knows, um, so we, we didn't have a whole lot of questions this time around, um, at least until the last minute. Uh, but we it's also like kind of generally understood that anthropology is kind of a it's it's a little bit of a difficult subject, um, and a lot of you are going to be learning as you go, and uh, likewise having questions as you go. Um, so don't be afraid to post uh, any of the questions that you have. Um, in the Ecology AMA questions, there's going to be like a, a line showing the questions that were put in before and the ones that were after, but we'll try and get to um, pretty much everything that we can. If your question is answered um, over the course of the general uh, overview, um, or if it's, if it's answered uh, by other people in the chat, we'll probably just skip over it. Uh, if you feel that we, if you, if you don't feel that your question was answered uh, to the full extent, uh, just let me know and we can uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. And again, this is being recorded again. Um, all of our AMAs are recorded, so you will be able to listen through after uh, we're done with everything. It should be up uh, within an hour after we're done. Is anybody else having trouble hearing? If you are, say something in the AMA voice text channel. All right, great. Uh, Ant King, it looks like you are currently unmuted at this point in time. Thank you. All right. Well, once everybody's all settled in, I am ready to go. Yeah, I think, um, is anybody else having trouble uh, hearing? Uh, say something in the AMA voice text if you are. Please. Great. 
Uh, Miles, I think we're good to go. Again, everybody just double click on Miles and it'll show the PowerPoint presentation. All right, Sol, do you wanna do you have anything else to say or should I get going here? Um no, I think we're good. Just everybody please be respectful of uh, Miles' time and uh try and if people have questions that you can answer in the chat, um go ahead and just uh answer those uh so that we because because there's probably gonna be a lot more uh questions than usual uh kinda coming in in the middle of things, uh than usual. So I I'm asking for a little bit of help from everybody to kind of uh make sure that the chat uh, goes smoothly, basically. But other than that, uh, you got the floor. All yours. All right. Well, uh, as you're probably aware, my name is Miles Maxer. I am a early career entomologist, and my work is focused on ants. I'm also the founder and director of the Ant Network, which is a science communication organization that uses ants and other insects to get people excited about science and about entomology. And we also have a very large component of that organization being dedicated to teaching people how to keep ants in captivity. And we really treasure the opportunity to be that resource for this community as well. All right, so today I have the honor to talk to you about ant ecology and sort of what is ant ecology, what's insect ecology and whatnot. Um, I'm going to give a fairly basic overview um, of ant ecology, insect ecology, and then we're going to have questions about that specifically, and we'll actually round out the end of this session with a general Q&A where we can talk about any topics uh, related to ants or science communication or science itself. So once again, thank you so much for joining us. What you're seeing on your screens right now would be me photographing some African elephants in South Africa. So in addition to being an entomologist, I'm also an ecologist and science communicator. And one of the exciting things about a career in those fields is that you get to do a lot of awesome traveling and a lot of really cool research. So here's a picture of me giving a talk at the Entomological Society of America. I wanted to include that because we will be having some presentations at ESA this November. So have that on your radar, there's going to be an ant keeping symposium, which Sol has done a fantastic job of organizing. You'll hear more about that later on. Uh, the Ant Network isn't just all about Miles Maxer either. I wanted to introduce our team to you. Uh, on the left there, we have Ben, who is our wonderful media producer. So if you enjoy our series like The Ant Explorer or Ant Keeping 101, you have Ben to thank for most of that. He does a fantastic job of editing our videos and being able to tell even more compelling stories. In the middle there, we have Jen Schlauch. She is a uh, graphic illustrator and an accomplished hymenopterist on her own right. Uh, she also knows quite a bit about ants. And we met her when we were filming some videos over in Madagascar in partnership with the California Academy of Sciences. Uh, then we have Thomas. He is our business manager and CFO. And of course, myself on the right there, I'm Miles Maxer. All right, so let's catch everybody up as to what insect ecology is. Ecology is the study of the relationships between organisms and the environment. And of course, entomology is the study of insects. Insect ecology is kind of the amalgamation of both of those different study areas. And we're looking at ecology through a lens of insects specifically. Uh, it's important to note that entomology itself is kind of an independent discipline, and it's uniquely independent. We have military entomologists, for example. Entomology is a very, very important uh, field of the natural sciences, and that's because of the impact of insects on humans, either as invasive species or affecting our food supply, or they have different effects on the environment. Insects have a disproportionate role to play uh, amongst environments and ecosystems around the world. Uh, in insect ecology, we study insect diversity. We study their abundance and their distribution. We also study the way that insects have an impact on ecosystems. 
We study the integration of basic and applied knowledge of entomology and other fields in the natural sciences. And then, of course, the uniqueness of insects in the biosphere poses unique and interesting questions to insect ecologists, entomologists, people who are interested in understanding how the natural world works and how insects in particular affect those things. Now, there's a couple other terms that I'm going to introduce you to. Ought ecology is the study of individual organisms uh, in relation to their environment. So that would be one species and occasionally even just one individual organism and how that individual has an impact on its environment. So uh, we can either look at ought ecology as a single species analysis or even just a single individual analysis. And then we have synecology, which is the study of groups of organisms. This is often multiple species, and then their relation to the environment and relation to other species and groups of species as well. Now, ant ecology, of course, is insect ecology, but focused on ants. And we are in particular interested in the relationships between ants, which are in the uh, family Formicidae. We're also interested in how they interact with other organisms and the environment itself. And a couple different areas of interest within ant ecology are invasive species. So one of the most common uh, reasons that we study ants in the environment is because they have a propensity to become invasive species. You don't have to look very far to find uh, the red imported fire ants all across the uh, southern and southeastern United States. Uh, we have invasive ant species all over the world that do billions and billions of dollars in damage to our agricultural economies. Uh, and of course, they, uh, they do immeasurable damage to uh, human happiness because they affect our ability to enjoy the outdoors. So invasive species are critically important for us to understand. And many myrmecologists specifically study invasive ants. We also look at how ants provide ecosystem services. Now, this is how essentially the ants and their behaviors and their existence within the ecosystem benefits us and it benefits other uh, kind of areas in the ecosystem. For example, we look at ants as ecosystem engineers because they actually move more soil around the world than earthworms do, even though, of course, in school, you will learn about how earthworms aerate the soil. Well, yes, they do, but ants actually play a bigger role in that. Ants do other things with the ecosystem, of course. They essentially are the uh, trash picker-uppers of the natural world. If you you know drop an ice cream cone on the sidewalk, the ants are gonna come and, and lick that up. If something dies on the forest floor in the Amazon, got a really good chance that some ants are going to find it. Uh, and they are really critical in kind of the um, mixing of resources, uh, the mixing of nutrients in ecosystems all over the world. And in fact, ants are present on every continent, ironically, except for Antarctica. And they can be viewed sort of as a group of keystone species where without ants, our world will look very, very different. We're also interested in ant ecology because of these things that absolutely captivate people uh, under the kind of umbrella of mutualism, symbiosis, and parasitism. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth here later on. And then, of course, ant ecology has major impacts on how we keep ants and how we understand what ants do in the environment and how we also understand how to care for them in captivity. Of course, understanding how ants impact ecosystems will help us tell more compelling stories about ants and it will improve our ability to create displays to keep those live ants in captivity and to keep them really healthy, uh, which is of course important to everybody here. All right, so now let's talk about uh, one of the most popular uh, topics for this uh, lecture series is that we've got um, kind of the way that ants interact with other ants. At the top here, you see intraspecies interactions. So this is uh, between, um, th these are ant colonies of the same species that are interacting with each other. So you'll see territoriality and that 
um, is essentially, uh, for example, you have like two pavement ant colonies of Tetramorium immigrants. And folks have, it's a species that has become famous because people find these colonies having little territorial disputes. So ants within the same species often have different territories and they don't have a lot of overlap because those territories are um, kind of, they're, they're sanctioned, they are protected and the, the borders are enforced. Of course, uh, those borders are changing all the time as different colonies uh, have different advantages and abilities. The interspecies interactions also continue with reproduction. And then we also have the competition for resources. And that can be food resources, that can be uh, habitat, nesting habitat, anything like that. Um, I'm going to pause for just a moment. It seems like we're having some issues on in the chat of, of folks being able to see our live stream. So I'm just going to pause real quick and make sure we can get that sorted. Uh, no, uh, looks like we're fine. We're fine? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and continue. So we also have interspecies interactions, and those are uh, ants of different species interacting in the environment. Of course, you have territoriality between ants of different species. You also have competition for resources. Oftentimes, many ants um, will compete for uh, the resources available in the environment. Um, looks like some folks are maxed out uh, on the number of folks able to see the stream. The good news is this is being recorded and you don't have to be able to see the slides to enjoy this recording uh, or to enjoy this AMA. Anyway, I'm looping back now to interspecies interactions. We covered territoriality a little bit there and they do have quite a bit of... Um, uh, they, they battle essentially for resources in the environment. At the same time, different ant species occupy different ecological niches, and those niches uh, allow them to uh, coexist without uh, competing for resources, resources constantly. Uh, and then finally, we also have social parasitism. And here in the image on the right hand side, there's an ant of the genus Polyergus, which are Amazon ants or slave-making ants. And then the ant on the left there is a formica uh, worker ant. Of course, polyergus are the classic slave raiding ants. They're the ones who will infiltrate existing ant colonies uh, and steal their brood and raise those pupae into workers. And those workers will serve the colony, um, the host colony of polyergus. So if you are interested in studying ant ecology, there's a lot of different ways in which we do that. Uh, on the left-hand side there, you can see I'm holding a pangolin. Now this is a pangolin that was rescued uh, from the poaching trade actually in South Africa. And pangolins are quite tragically the most illegally trafficked and poached animal in the world. And what's interesting about pangolins to me, aside from just how cute and incredible they are, is that they eat ants. And I was in South Africa at one point in the last year uh, looking to see uh, which ants these pangolins seem to be preferring. And we looked at the ants that were found in their gut contents. I observed them in the field and here's one that got too cold during a rainstorm. Uh, so I was warming her up against my chest. Um, I, see, I saw a question there, why are pangolins poached? They are poached for the scales, that which are made of keratin, you can, if, if you're in the stream, you can see those scales alongside their body. Uh, and unfortunately, some East Asian uh, traditional medicine uh, claims that the scales have a beneficial effect uh, on, on humans, particularly on, um, on men and their performance. Uh, and unfortunately, of course, that's just not true. Uh, they might as well eat their own fingernails because it has the exact same content. But uh, we're doing our best to better communicate uh, the science behind these things and give people options, <laughs> uh, medical options that will actually solve the problems and the challenges that they face. But luckily, uh, China seems to be uh, increasing their 
uh, resources uh, to battle this issue, and we are seeing some progress being made, but it's still absolutely tragic. In the middle here, we have a uh, pseudomyrmex ant. This is eating kind of a, uh, a fruiting body that the acacia tree has produced for it. Um, and I put this in here because I want you to know that simply observing ants in the environment is a way to practice ant ecology. And if you are ever seeing things that are interesting to you, something that you think might be of interest to science, make sure to take notes, make sure to always have the location, the time of day, the environment, all of the important metadata that we use to um, kind of record things in time uh, in nature, make sure you do that when you see things. So you can also be a citizen scientist, anti-ecologist. And then on the right hand there, you can see me, I'm actually up in a tree in Madagascar looking at ants that we collected as part of a sampling project. So anti-ecologists go all over the world. We do a lot of looking at the ants in ecosystems and it's honestly um, the, the, one of the most exciting parts of the work that I get to do. So let's talk about a couple of specific areas within ant ecology, and that is, one of those is mutualism. On the right-hand side there, we have a Pseudomyrmex acacia ant, and right there, that's a bullhorn acacia um, thorn, and they actually have hollow insides that are um, designed via natural selection to be the perfect home for this very specific species of ant, which also uh, protects the plant. So what the plant does is it provides living quarters for this particular ant species. It also provides uh, these fruiting bodies full of uh, the nutrients that the ants need that's in that center picture there. And the in return, the ants protect that tree from uh, herbivores that might eat on it, uh, from other ant species, anything uh, that could be deleterious to that tree. The ants are absolutely ready to, to intercept, which is really awesome. And then, of course, ants are mutualists with hemipterans. Oh, we got a question. Where did these grow again? This is in Central America, but there are examples of this kind of mutualism all over the world. Uh, and ants will also form mutualistic and sometimes symbiotic relationships with hemipterans. Now, hemipterans, that is a... Uh, uh, a group of insects that have little, they're sort of like straws, uh, little sucking mouth parts. And what they do is they suck the sap out of plants. Well, plant sap is almost entirely sugar. It has a little bit of protein, a little bit of other stuff that's important for the aphids, but it's mostly sugar. And the, the ants aren't, or the aphids aren't that interested in the sugar. So the pressure of the sap in the plant coming through the straw essentially just forces sugar water out of the anus of the aphids or meal bugs or, or whatever it is, uh, the different hemipterans. Well, ants have figured out, whoa, this is just like cattle. And what they do is they farm the hemipterans to make sure to uh, essentially get that really sweet liquid, which is called honeydew. And you can actually simulate this in cap captivity if you want to. It's a fairly difficult thing to do, but once you... Once you get it all dialed in, it can be really awesome. Um, but that symbiosis exists in nature all over the place. And it's a really interesting example of a mutualistic relationship where the ants benefit from the aphids producing the sugar water, and then the aphids uh, benefit because the ants will protect them against predators like ladybugs uh, or a praying mantis, for example. Uh, I could go on for hours and hours about different examples of, of plants uh, being mutualistic with ants and hemipterans being mutualistic with ants, but we're going to continue because I want to make sure to cover everybody's questions as well. And then we also have uh, an example called social parasitism. And this is kind of the relationship that can occur between ants of two different species where one ant is... Um, dependent on the ants of another species to actually do the manual labor in the colony. So there are different levels of social parasitism. The first would be temporary. And that a good example of that would be something like Lacey's claviger, where 
the uh, queen ant of Laceus claviger will infiltrate a colony of Laceus neoniger. And Laceus neoniger is just your typical cornfield ant. There's the little brown cute ants, nothing special really about them. They exist, they exist primarily along the edges of woodlands, uh, and they're a great golf course pest, of course, as well. But Laceus claviger, the citronella ants, those queens are not able to start colonies on their own. So many ant species, as most of you are aware, are fully claustral or semi-claustral, which is essentially that when a queen goes off to start a new colony, they're able to do so on their own. But with social parasitic ants, they can't. So what they do is they infiltrate another colony. In the example I'm using right now, Laceus claviger will uh, infiltrate the colony of a Laceus neoniger uh, nest. They'll go, she will go down after masking herself with the colony scent of the host ants, the Laceus neoniger. She'll go down, find the queen, tackle the queen, cut her open, smear all of her hemolymph, which is like insect blood all over her, and the host queen will die, and the social parasitic queen will take over the colony. And of course, the workers, if this works correctly, have no idea that mom has just been assassinated and the colony's been taken over. So that's an example of temporary social parasitism because the Laceus claviger has now established herself in an existing colony. She will lay eggs. Those workers will take care of her and, and her brood and raise them up to be uh, ad adult workers. However, that colony can go on for years and years without needing brood of a host ant like Laceus neoniger. Now we move on to something called obligate social parasites. So these are ants that go through the same thing that I just described earlier. However, their workers are either incapable or unwilling to do all of the work in the colony. So they actually have to have slaves or servant ants for the entire colony's life, for the colony's entire lifespan. And these obligate social parasites are also known as slave raiding ants. And again, that's like the polyergus, for example, where they will go out, find a host colony like Formica um, podzolica, go down in there, steal the brood, take it back to the polyergus nest, and then raise that brood as their own slaves, essentially. And they have to do that for the entire lifespan of that polyergus colony. And then we have inquiline ants. Now, this is an area that continues to emerge as something that's interesting, where there are uh, ant species that live within other ant colonies. Um, Anergades is an example within Tetramorium, where that ant species has to live within another ant colony. But what they are not doing is attacking the queen or stealing the brood. All they're doing is living within it and benefiting from uh, the food sources, the free care, uh, the nannies, essentially the, the services uh, within that colony. Those inquiline ants benefit from living inside that colony. And oftentimes they are not, uh, the, the host colony isn't even aware that they are there. And if they are, they don't care. Yeah, again, another topic that we could talk about for hours and hours and hours uh, because there are so many examples and it is so, so complex. And uh, now I'd like to open it up for your questions on ant ecology specifically. Uh, as a reminder, we will do uh, general kind of ant questions, science questions after this point. But right now we're just going to focus on your questions. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to go down the list uh, and read, uh, read what people have asked. So Matt Biologist uh, asks, Why is it that some species will cohabitate nests with other unrelated species? How does this work and why don't they end up fighting? For example, Formica podzolica nesting with Laceus species and keeping their brood together. Quote from Antwiki provided. Well, one thing I'll say is that that's a really excellent question. And unfortunately, it's not super well understood how that works because it's incredibly difficult to study. If you flip the rock, the ants lose their minds, and oftentimes they'll start fighting. So it's really difficult to see exactly how uh, that cohabitation is working underground without disturbing the colonies. 
Um, that said, having flipped literally hundreds of rocks with ant colonies of different species cohabitating, oftentimes there is a fairly large wall in between the two colonies. And we sort of hypothesize that when the ants encounter each other underground, their reaction is more to block that entrance and secure the area uh, rather than go in and attack. Um, I've also seen colonies of Manica uh, living under rocks with Formica. And there's a hypothesis that's quite interesting that Manica actually are ant, uh, either scavengers or even hunters, and that they may be cohabitating with their prey. And essentially, uh, due to a lack of suitable habitat, their prey has no choice but to live near them. Um, there's many different possible explanations for why individual species might nest near each other. Of course, we have examples like thief ants, which are the Solenopsis molesta group, where they will live within or near existing ant colonies. And because they are so small, they're actually able to infiltrate those colonies and steal their food, steal their brood, take resources and uh, protection services from those host colonies. So uh, with many, many different ant species all over the world, some of them cohabitating, there's no catch-all answer as to why or how that works. But I will say it's a super difficult thing to study. And if you observe ant species living, uh, kind of cohabitating or living very near each other, that's one of those observations you should definitely be recording and in great detail, because one of the ways that we can improve our understanding of that topic is uh, kind of by combining our collective knowledge. And that's a great example of a way that ant keepers and people interested in anting uh, can contribute to science is simply by posting their observations and doing so in a very professional manner that has all the different metadata that we need um, to consider it a credible observation. Uh, of course, posting something uh, like a picture on iNaturalist is a great way to record where something occurred, when it occurred, uh, and to allow that information to be trackable. So that's that's a great example of a way that you can contribute. Okay, uh, there's a bunch of questions from Jordan, but I believe that he's got those all rephrased down below. So moving on to the next one, Ant King asks, how do ants react to a mite outbreak within a colony while they're captive? Are they aware of their presence and what do they do to stop it? So this is another uh, area where I can only generalize a little bit. Different ant species will react, will react differently. Um, some of them seem to be aware of the mites and others seem to be unaware. One of the things that ants do in the wild is that they will transfer nests and they do that much more frequently than I think a lot of ant keepers realize. Uh, I was recently down in Arizona and there's a species of long-legged ant called a uh, Nova Master Cockarelli and they will move their nest even multiple times in a year and they'll actually have pre-built nests a few meters away from the main colony, and they'll move the whole colony away from that old nest. And one of the reasons that they may do that is if something like mites or uh, other arthropods are kind of infesting their old nest, they can actually just move away. And of course, ant keepers don't always provide uh, the kind of nesting space that ants need if they need to, to move away from the old nest. Within captivity, um, Mites definitely are a struggle. And I work really, really hard with my own colonies to keep mites out of them in the first place. Um, there is a predatory mite, I think it's called Hypoapsis uh, miles, and which, by the way, badass name, very cool. <laughs> uh, and this predatory mite has been known to take down um, other mites and uh, arthropods that we commonly find within ant nests. So sometimes they can be employed to get rid of those mites. But I think the original question was more focused on how do ants react to mites in captivity? And um, for lack of better words, pretty negatively. Uh, in many cases, they will try to get rid of those mites. They'll try and kill them. At the same time, of course, the mites, having lived in uh, the ant's environment, smell like the ants. And because most ant species live essentially in a chemical world that they smell, uh, they smell their world, and that's their primary way of understanding um, kind of what's around them. 
it's hard for them to detect those mites and to actually remove them. Uh, the last thing I'll say about that is that oftentimes the mites that occur in ant colonies in captivity are grain mites. Grain mites are, they're, they're not uh, mites that are going to attach themselves to your ants and drink their hemolymph. But what they do is they eat the detritus and the decaying material in the nest. And one of the fears that ant keepers often have is that those grain mites will then attack the brood once the uh, easier food source is eliminated. So you should always be observing your ants, looking for mites. If you do see the mites, make sure you move the ants to a new nest. You can always use a small paintbrush to remove the mites. And if you're really having trouble, feel free to send me a message and I can give you more detailed instructions on how to remove them. Okay. Uh, Ogre asks, are there any significant misconceptions about ant colony behavior that you'd like to debunk? Uh, there are so many, um, but the main message I would give you in answering that question is to remember that humans, we like to anthropomorphize, right? So we like to uh, think about other organisms and what they're doing and, and the intentions, the reasons that they do things around sort of a human-centric lens. And we do that a lot with ants. We think of ants as little miniature societies. And oftentimes people will watch an ant and come to a conclusion that, uh, of what that ant is doing. And science has told us that quite often we are wrong <laughs> in our understanding of ant behavior on the first go around because we are anthropomorphizing. We think, oh, that ant is bringing food in the colony because they know that this other ant is really hungry. Well, that's not exactly how things work. Um, we also tend to anthropomorphize subjects like pain with ants where we think, oh, um, uh, on one side, people say, oh, you know, ants can absolutely feel pain and emotional distress. And there's a whole other uh, side where folks say, oh, ants can't feel pain, don't worry about it. And of course, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle where they do feel physical discomfort, um, but not necessarily the emotional discomfort that we sometimes associate. So the biggest mix misconceptions about ant behavior almost always tie back to anthropomorphizing uh, what we're seeing and not really thinking hard about um, why an ant might be doing something. Okay. Uh, Jordan asks, colonies often steal brood, but do they ever steal workers as well? Colonies often steal brood, but do they ever steal workers? Probably not intentionally. Uh, the Myrmicocystis, which are honeypot ants of the southwestern United States, they will actually go on raids of colonies of their own species and they'll still brood, but they'll also steal the replete workers, the honey pots that are full of the uh, liquids that the colony is storing. So that's an example where they will steal adults, but they're stealing them more for the resources inside. Oftentimes they will be slaughtered once they're brought back to the other colony and uh, the liquid inside drained, uh, which is <laughs> a little dark. Uh, but but generally, no. Ants are not stealing uh, adult workers of other species or the same species, but they will target the brood. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and to follow up on that, Jordan asks, and I, 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 I think he's just positing this, workers can adapt to new colonies easily. How often does this happen? Can you, can you repeat that for me, sure. please? She says, workers can adapt adapt to new colonies easily, how often does this happen? Um, well, I would push back on that a little bit. Uh, if the colony pheromone is different, oftentimes they will not uh, adapt to a new colony very easily. Nascent workers or callow workers that have just eclosed are much more likely to take to a foreign colony or a foreign queen because they don't really have the same um, chemical imprinting. Uh, and they're honestly not very um, active at that stage of life. But no, ant colonies are actually fairly rigid in their structure, and they don't tend to tolerate a lot of changes. And one of the changes that they don't tolerate very well would be a colony transfer. That being acknowledged, um, an area of interest for me is essentially looking at how long does it take for a colony that has lost its queen to become receptive to new queens? And of course, that's going to, va uh, to vary a lot with different ant species. But we did observe it in Arizona with Myrmicocystis mendax, where 
a the queen of the, of a colony was removed. Most of the colony was taken, but there was a colony fragment. And then about five months after that point in time, we introduced a new queen, and they seemed to have accepted her. So that's an area of interest for me. That kind of uh, <laughs> that kind of answered the follow-up question, which was, uh, how often do isolated colonies accept new reproductives, and uh, how can it be beneficial for the host and the queen? Um, if you had anything more you wanted to say on that, or if you feel like you answered it pretty thoroughly. Uh, I don't have much more to say on that. It's not super well understood, and of course, it's a really difficult thing to generalize across the 12,000 plus ant species. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so another question. Uh, how flexible are worker roles? Can foragers and nest workers easily transition to new roles if the conditions require it? That's an excellent question. Again, species dependent, like every question that anybody has ever asked. Uh, and I would also direct you to look at uh, Deborah Gordon's work on the different roles that worker ants play. But what I can say is that there seems to be a general plasticity in worker roles where if a certain um, task isn't getting done in the colony, the ants are going to generally be able to identify that that task isn't getting done, and some of them will then switch to fill that role. Um, a lot of the worker role determination has to do with the age of the workers, but that is uh, increasingly important as the colony scales and essentially becomes mature. When you have a nascent colony with only, say, 20 workers, the, uh, the ants are more likely to exhibit that behavioral and role plasticity where they will take on different roles uh, as they adjust to kind of the needs in the colony. Um, so essentially, as a colony grows, uh, the fewer, um, the, the less plasticity is required in worker roles and, and adjustments. But of course, they adjust their behavior as well uh, based on kind of the environmental cues and the resources the colony needs. Of course, as a colony goes into diapause, they uh, will require different um, kind of resource gathering and nest maintenance than they would at the uh, in, in the spring. Well, uh, okay. thank you for all of the compliments in the chat regarding my voice. I do remember when my voice was compared to a V8 car engine. That was interesting. All right, let's continue with the next question. <laughs> okay. Um... What do workers do when there's no brood, and how does the entire colony adapt to a lessening food burden? Well, that absolutely ties into what I was talking about earlier. Um, brood is sort of the central motivator of an ant colony, right? If the brood is hungry, then the ants are going to forage for more food. Um, if the if the brood is kind of exploding and there's not enough space, the ants are going to adjust the size of uh, the chambers to account for that. Um, one of the great ant films, Empire of the Desert Ants, which was made by the BBC and my mentor Ray Mendez, uh, was definitely guilty of the sin of anthropomorphizing, where they're like, okay, it's the queen, and her, she's got this great empire, and she demands things of the ants. And the truth is the brood, particularly the larvae, are actually the um, the, the real ones in control. And they affect what the, the workers do. In times of no brood, essentially, and that would be almost always during diapause or quiescence, the ants are most, much more likely to be less active. And if anything, they're going to focus more on uh, preparing the nest itself than uh, on food collection, for example. If there's, uh, Of course, it's a, it's a great example of supply and demand. There's less demand, they're going to need to supply less food for the colony and they'll work on other things or they'll just conserve their energy. So there's a tie-in question for that a uh, little bit further down um, regarding how the brood communicate that. Is it through uh, pheromones or um, like physical distress? Do we, do we understand how that works? Um, all of the above. Uh, there are lots of different ways in which larvae will communicate to workers that they are hungry. And one thing that we have <laughs> observed in colonies of Myrmecocystis, which again are the honeypot ants, is that those larvae are actually incredibly mobile, where they will move around the nest 
uh, and essentially demand food. Um, but larvae will have different ways of communicating essentially within different species, and they will have different requirements um, given different stages of life and then uh, where they are in a nest, that sort of thing. Um, but yes, they, uh, they, they have many different tools to signify, uh, signal to the workers that something's not right. Okay, so, um, and more from Jordan, uh, what is the reason behind a colony preference towards having workers as foragers? And I feel like this ties in nicely with um, getting away from anthropomorphizing them. It, it, it makes sense to us that the older workers would make, um, would be, they don't have as much as long to live. Um, so it's, it's better uh, for them to be like sacrificed in a risky kind of proposition or um, task. Uh, but what, what's going on with the ants from uh, their point of view, essentially? Um, it, it's really not terribly complicated. As a worker ages, uh, she will fill different roles in the colony. This has been extensively studied in Pogona Murmex, um, ironically about a quarter mile from uh, the workshop where I work with Ray in southern Arizona. Um, there is the American Museum of Natural History's Southwestern Research Station. That's where a lot of the research has been done on Pogona Murmex uh, by Dr. Deborah Gordon from Stanford. And essentially what they find is that the, the workers, as they age, fill those different uh, roles in the colony. And it seems to be almost strictly age dependent in an established nest. But as I said earlier, uh, there's more plasticity in young nests where there aren't enough workers to fill all the different roles. So they have to uh, do many different ones themselves. Um, I hope I answered that question. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that I got the essence of it. Uh, do individual workers have the ability to develop foraging experience over time? As in, do they get better or um, approach things differently as they uh, lean into the role? That's a wonderful question and a really difficult one for me to answer. <laughs> uh, what I can tell you anecdotally is that I have absolutely seen ants in captivity seem to not only learn the environment, uh, but also learn how to hunt different live insects. So I like to feed my Campanotus colonies and Formica colonies live fruit flies. And the first time you do that within the nest, uh, within the outworld, the ants go crazy, they run around, and they're really not very good at catching the fruit flies. But around the fifth time, you can tell the workers that have actually tried to capture fruit flies before, and they are way, way better at it. And um, so they definitely have the capacity to learn at least a little bit, but exactly how much is one of those areas in myrmecology that isn't super well understood. Of course, it's a very difficult thing to study, but I mean, wow, what an interesting topic um, and an interesting thing for ant keepers to kind of keep an eye out for and observe. <laughs> Okay. Um, how do colonies or workers determine when they should be passive or aggressive when dealing with other ants? Um, that's going to be very species dependent. Um, mm -hmm. But you will see uh, colonies of different species um, kind of vary in their responses a lot. So uh, I'll give you an example where Dory Myrmex is this tiny little... Um, kind of Dolly Cotterine species in the southwestern United States. And if they are present near uh, colonies of Pogonomermex or Myrmecocystis or Novomesser, uh, those ants, the larger ants, are not going to be happy because what Dory Myrmex do, those little jerks, is they throw sand pebbles and stuff down the entrances of the larger ants to try and stop them from foraging so that the little Dory Myrmex can go get uh, food. Um, that's an example of kind of uh, harassment, <laughs> and the ants, uh, the larger species, are not going to be tolerant of Dory Myrmex. Um, in a similar situation, you might have a colony of Novomesser living near a colony of Myrmecocystis mexicanus, which are nocturnal honeypot ants. And generally, they're going to ignore each other's presence. They don't really care. They sort of occupy uh, slightly different niches. They 
uh, forage at different times. So their reaction to encountering a forager of each other's species is going to be very different than their reaction of encountering Dory Myrmex, for example. A huge extreme is when an ant encounters uh, army ants, specifically Niva Myrmex in the southwestern United States. And their response to Niva Myrmex is uh, extremely hostile because Niva Myrmex, what they do is they infiltrate other ant colonies and steal all of their brood just to eat it. So if you put Niva Myrmex down uh, the nest entrance of Nova Messer, for example, you can get the entire Nova Messer colony to erupt out of the nest uh, to try and get away from the invading army ants. And that's one way you can actually collect colonies of Nova Messer is by getting about 200 army ants, throwing them down the nest entrance. And the queen and the brood, they're going to bring everything out. Um, so again, the way in which ants react to other ants uh, varies a lot uh, in, among different species and, of course, different areas. Uh, I do not <laughs> encourage you to go around and collecting tons of Nova Messer nests using this myrmecologist hack, but it is a way to collect those colonies and make sure that you do it in a very conservative manner. But it's absolutely fascinating behavior to observe. And if you ever find, and this is specific for the southwestern United States, if you ever find an ant colony that seems to have evacuated all the brood, all the queens onto the top of the nest, the chances are they're being raided by Niva Myrmex underground. So, um, I, these, these questions have been kind of answered already. I guess I'll go ahead and ask them. Can individual colonies become more paranoid than others? Uh, yes. I'm Paranoid is sort of a, almost an anthropomorphic <laughs> way to, to say it, but essentially the essence of the question is, do ant colonies kind of change in their temperament over time? And they absolutely can. One thing that you can do with colonies that don't have a lot of uh, soldiers or major workers in captivity is you can start throwing in a couple of ants of another species into their outworld. Uh, and this is only for uh, very well-established colonies, but what they will do in response is produce more majors or more soldiers, uh, and they might protect the entrance more. So their behavior does change according to different conditions and according to the organisms that they are encountering in the environment. That's really interesting. Why do some colonies which have experienced a die-off simply prefer not to forage as much? even if they're beginning brood production again? Is this a psychological reaction? How does this behavior persist? persist? So how do, why do young colonies not forage as well, much as others? Colonies, Is that the... colonies that have experienced a die off specifically. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, and how does that impact? Um, of course, die off can mean many different things. There's, there's the natural cycle where you have a generation of workers that are simply aged out and they will uh, die off. Or you might be losing ants because, oh, you forgot to water the formicarium for too long and you lost half the colony. So uh, the impacts of a natural die off versus a unnatural die off can be very different. Um, that said, if an ant colony loses too much of its workforce uh, unexpectedly and they don't have the workers they need to recover or they don't have any brood left, that kind of thing, that can create such shock within the colony that they sort of shut down normal behavior. Um, one hypothesis on this, if it's a established colony, is just that uh, the workers are not showing that role plasticity where uh, you only have young workers in the colony, so they're all ready just to uh, take care of the brood or just to work on the tunnels and they're not going to forage except they need to be foraging because all their foragers are dead, for example. Um, so that can happen in captivity. But by and large, if you have a, a colony that just kind of stops responding, um, something's wrong with the environment, and you need to uh, make sure that you're, you've got the right kind of formicarium, make sure that you are feeding them the right things, change the food up a little bit. Uh, essentially, that's a great indicator that your conditions are wrong. Ants are very hardy organisms, and they will generally respond uh, to changes in their environment. That being said, I have had co colonies that I would just say are 
kind of dull. They don't, they don't do very well. Maybe they produce 12 workers the first year and they add another six workers the next year and they just don't do very well. Um, that can be an indicator of kind of a, a dud queen. Uh, it can be an indicator of issues with their gut microbiota. There's tons of different ways in which an ant colony might fail to behave normally. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I encourage people to collect a couple of queens of each species they want to catch. Uh, I will I will uh, say as well, though, um, you shouldn't be collecting hundreds of queens uh, if you don't have the capacity to ethically care for them. I don't ever want to sound like somebody who is encouraging that because I very strongly do not encourage it. Uh, other than the general, um, generally well-known difference differences uh, to ant keepers uh, from a myrmecologist's perspective, how is the behavior of ants in the founding stage different than a well-established colony? Uh, the behavior in ants in the founding stage can be very, very different, uh, particularly with that first generation of workers, and, and those are nanotics. Um, and they have the highest behavioral plasticity, essentially. I know I keep using that term, but essentially they can fill almost any role in the colony. And as the colony grows, the workers will kind of fall into uh, more rigid roles. Um, you also see a progression in the kinds of foods and territories that a colony uh, will target given their size, right? Mm -hmm. So a 20 worker Myrmecocystis colony might just be foraging for food on the surface. But a 2,000 worker one might actually be tending aphids, the hemipterans we were talking about earlier. They might have um, a colony of mealybugs up in the trees that they harvest from. Uh, they might have general patrols in certain areas where they know there's more food or water, that kind of thing. So of course, the stronger the colony, uh, both in numbers and just physical presence, uh, the, the, the greater ability they're going to have to do different things. So a small colony will usually try and stay off the radar <laughs> and uh, just get the food that they can when they can. Okay. How do ants fight over food in the wild? What is the deciding factor between which colony gets the food? Is it, con is it a constant fight or so, does one fight retreat? One side retreat? Th that's again a very species specific thing, but most of the time the ants will essentially size each other up. And this is most common with ants of the same species when they encounter each other. You see it a lot in Myrmecocystis, not to use them again, but they actually fill a lot of the ant ecology topics very well, where they will actually kind of stand next to each other and position themselves to see which one is essentially larger. They, they put themselves as tall as they can possibly stand, put their gasters up, that kind of thing. Granted, ants don't have great eyesight, but they seem to have a decent understanding of kind of size comparisons. Um, and you will see that amongst both ants of the same species and occasionally of ants of different species when they encounter each other and they are trying to enforce a, a certain territory. One of the things that ants do to keep their food source kind of to themselves is they will either be occupying a very unique specific niche where other ant species in the area aren't going for that same type of food, or they will have uh, a lot of... Um, essentially backup. They'll have soldiers, majors, that sort of thing to protect the colony as they extract that food resource. So we are getting towards the end of the questions of the, um, the questions that were posted before the AMA. Um, there's only a few left here. What are some mutualistic or parasitic relationships that ants have with vertebrates? Uh, I'm not familiar of any um, mutualistic relationships with vertebrates, although there are a lot of birds that will go anting, is the behavior we call it, where they will fly to something like a formic obscurippi's nest and harass the ants such that the ants will apply formic acid. And that seems to be beneficial to the birds getting rid of parasites um, and, and essentially staying clean of parasites. That being said, that's not beneficial for the ants. Right, that's only beneficial for the birds. They're using the ants for the formic acid, but the ants aren't benefiting from being attacked by a robin that landed on their colony. Um, I'm not familiar of any vertebrates that have mutualistic relationships. Of course, 
as I was saying earlier, mutualism has to result in a benefit for both of the organisms in the relationship. Um, so like the pangolins benefit from ants by eating the ants, but of course the ants aren't benefited uh, by the pangolin eating them. Um, so you really have to look at mutualistic relationships where you have benefits on both sides. And I'm not familiar with any examples of vertebrates and ants both benefiting from a relationship that they might have in the environment. Okay. Um, Zote asks, how are ants able to survive many months with no food and only a moisture source? Well, ants uh, are able to store food in their bodies, and they're able to store it in a way that isn't, uh, it's, it's not being digested, right? So it's not degrading the quality of the food. Um, but of course, they slow their metabolism way, way down. This is particularly true during diapause uh, for those ants that are in colder areas. And it's also true for quiescence, which are uh, for ants in very warm areas where there might be a lack of food and a lack of uh, water. So they will uh, slow their metabolism down. They'll, they'll stop moving around, stop foraging because it's not worth it. And they'll just kind of exist. And unlike humans, because we have to constantly produce heat to keep our bodies uh, going, ants don't have to do that. Uh, so they actually expend way less energy proportionally than we do. If a human was shrunk down to the size of an ant, it would die instantly uh, for many different reasons, but particularly because it would work so hard to keep itself warm, it would actually kill itself. There would be no way for it to get enough energy to maintain its body temperature uh, fast enough before it perished. So that's one of the reasons you can't shrink keep people down. <laughs> we would die immediately, uh, whereas ants can have a much slower metabolism um, than we can. You mean Marvel lied to me? Marvel absolutely <laughs> lied to us. Uh, but kudos to the recent Ant-Man movies because they have put in a little bit of effort in keeping the ants accurate. Um, <laughs> Which, which, of course, we appreciate. <laughs> okay. Ogre asks, uh, can you provide an example of the ecological importance of individual, larger, or older ant colonies um, on the, the habitat that they're in? Yeah. So as I was talking about earlier, ants are often considered keystone species, which means that they have a disproportionate importance to essentially playing a role in an ecosystem. And that without ants, the ecosystem would work completely differently or look very, very different. Um, and a large ant colony is, of course, going to have the greatest impact in that ecosystem. And when they are removed or they die off, sometimes that ecosystem will look very different even a few weeks after that point in time. So the removal of colonies and then the subsequent observation of those ecosystems have showed us that they seem to have a big role. Uh, let's take an example of uh, acacia ants, Azteca, down in uh, South America. Well, they live in a mutualistic relationship with Cecropia, which is a kind of plant. Well, if the ant colony that lives with the Cecropia plant dies, that plant will probably die uh, if it's not quickly taken up by another ant of that species. Because what they do in that situation is they keep other plants from growing and taking the sunlight and the nutritional resources in the area. Um, so the uh, sudden absence or presence of large ant colonies has a huge impact on how nutrients are cycled, on what other organisms can live or cannot live in a, a certain area in an ecosystem. And it's one of the reasons that invasive species can be so wildly destructive is that they can come in and have massive colonies that fundamentally change how that ecosystem functions. Okay. Um, there's a few questions here that are more general, so I'm going to skip over those for now. Um, Ogre asks, are captive ant colonies made less ready to respond to an attack from a different colony because of the fact that they're sheltered from threats of the sort during most of their life? Yes, I would say so. Um, it doesn't mean that they're helpless, but ant colonies in captivity often have uh, a smaller 
force of, of combatants ready to defend the colony because they're not constantly under pressure from threat. They often have less soldiers or majors in the colony because, of course, soldiers and major ants are the most expensive to produce resource-wise. And if you're not using them, then there's not much uh, for them to protect. or There's not much incentive for them to produce the more expensive uh, soldiers. So what you're saying is if we want to have more soldiers, we need to go like full Sid from Toy Story on our colony. <laughs> I, I think there's a healthy medium in between there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it could mean after you, of course, look at the mealworm to make sure it doesn't have mites on it, uh, you throw a live mealworm in the outworld um, where you do a little bit of harassing of your colony. A lot of folks are really afraid and they think that their ants are easily stressed and they're not very strong. And, and the truth is ants actually are quite hardy. There's a reason they dominate <laughs> the terrestrial landscape of planet Earth. And it's not because they are so easily stressed that if you bump their nest, they will completely lose their minds and fall apart. Uh, that being said, there are some very sensitive ants. I recognize that. But ultimately, ant keepers should have a little bit more um, uh, respect, I guess, for the resiliency of ants in their collection. And I'm definitely going to specifically call out Californians with Myrmecocystis. Uh, these are ants that can be kept in captivity. And that's something that I, I addressed another time. Um, but I, I look forward to talking to folks more about uh, ants that we consider sensitive amongst ant keepers, but frankly, we need to look more at the way we're keeping them and less at, oh my gosh, did I look at them wrong? Or did I shine a light on them and they got too stressed? Okay. Um, this is the last, I think there might be, yeah, okay. So how, how do ants maintain foraging trails in areas with constant changes? For example, desert ants where sandstorms, sandstorms are common or areas with high precipitation? Well, uh, a lot of that has to do with the fact that they lay down pheromone um, even when they're on an established trail. So they're almost always essentially um, maintaining those foraging trails. And the changes that occur are usually things that ants can surmount. You know, a rock slides. Okay, the ants are going to be confused a little bit. They'll fan out, and they're really good at finding each other and finding their way back home. And they will create a new pheromone trail. Uh, so again, ants are, are quite resilient. They are able to adjust to changing environmental conditions. You know, every time it rains, their pheromone trails go away. Uh, and at the same time, they're still able to reestablish them quite quickly and quite effectively. Okay. Um, so let, let's move into general Q&A, if you don't mind. Yep. That was the last of it. Uh, there, are, there are a couple... Um... Ooh, one more. Um, this one's... Yeah, yeah, okay, this is this is an interesting question. Um, L3 asks, why do some species seem to have much more variable behaviors and preferences per population? For example, parasitic lacea species, Pogonomarmex and Campanotis queens, seem to be heavily dependent on their genetics for successful colony foundation. I feel like there's a couple assumptions in there, if, but if you'd like to answer. There are some assumptions in there. Um, I, I honestly had a hard time following that. But I guess one thing I would say is that in an animal like ants, genetics dictate behavior. Um, and it has a huge impact on their uh, success. I think uh, Zeiss has a question here that he'd like to ask over voice. Zeiss, you there? Mm, he's dealing with some stuff. Okay, so let's move on to the general questions uh, for now, and we can circle back in a minute. Um, oh, uh, and there's a kind of a trailing question. <laughs> Sorry. Are there any interesting ant interactions that haven't been covered yet that you'd like to speak to? Um, if we haven't kind of given you the opening for that. Um, well, one, one big example of uh, ant ecology that I didn't even cover is the mutualistic relationship that fungus gardening ants or fungus growing ants have with the fungus. Um, and 
that's a, a huge example that we don't, you know, I didn't have time to detail too much. Uh, but uh, that's something I guess I would point out is if you're thinking about ants and mutualistic relationships, there's almost no mutualistic relationship, kind of more classic and also more complicated than um, the uh, fungus gardening ants and the fungi that they grow and take care of because they rely on each other. They cannot exist without each other. And that's um, ecologically not only fascinating for me as a scientist, but it's one of the more um, complex kind of questions that we have yet to fully uh, kind of un uncover and describe and answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go into the general questions. Uh... Um, I do want to let folks know I do have some announcements and things to share after the general q and I'm going to shoot for about another 15 minutes or so for general Q&A. Okay. Uh, uh, Zeiss has a question. Uh, go ahead. Could you hear me? Yep. All right. Hello. I do have a quick question. Um, back on Formaculture a few months ago, Drew posted an update for his Vero Messer Andre colony, and he was showing that um, he had a pile of seeds in the trash section that actually had been turned into a resin. Is this a product of captive keeping, or has this been recorded in the wild as well with other genus and species? I'm not sure if I heard you correctly. You say a pile of seeds that turned into a resin? Yeah, uh, I guess in their trash pile it seemed that a lot of the seeds had been turned into an actual resin. Um, I did post a YouTube video link in the AMA voice text if you'd like to take a look at it real quick. Sure, I'll take I'll take a look at that really quickly. Uh, so just bear with me, everybody. Yeah, so I think he's taking resin as. Uh, of course, this isn't. Um, Molecularly, I think the analogous to resin, yeah, it's, it, it's very hard. Well, what I see there is just a lot of ant waste, which can be very hard once it um, comes together. And the Nova Messer, I, I'm not familiar with Vero Messer in terms of captivity, but I know Nova Messer uh, will use kind of their refuse around the uh, the nest when it's kind of clean, essentially to reinforce it and make it harder kind of like concrete termites will mix their uh um, feces for example which are is of course um made for that purpose but they'll use that to reinforce the structures of their nests and i think that ants will often do the same uh but from that what it looks to me like is he's got a container he needs to clean more often <laughs> yeah um, he doesn't get around yeah. to his ants too much <laughs> yeah. all right thank you yep So Cosmic uh, Calamity has an interesting question. Are there any true mutualistic relationships between ant species? Yeah, so mutualism is sort of a catch-all term for a few other um, it's smaller terms that I don't want to get into because it's really complicated. Um, but essentially, are there ant species that, that depend on each other to exist? Um, I'm sure that there are, but there aren't any that come to mind because a lot of the time you have inquiline ants that live within colonies of other ants, but that host ant isn't necessarily, um, it doesn't necessarily require the presence of the inquiline, even if they sometimes would even benefit from it. Uh, I'll have to think about that a little bit more. All right. Um, are you good? I have, to, I have to step away from for just a quick minute. Are you good to uh, review the, the last several questions in the question channel um, and just pick the ones that you like, essentially? Yes, absolutely. I All can right. take a look. I'll be back in a minute. Uh, one of the questions, how did wasps even form even evolve to form a mutual relationship with fungus? Aren't most wasps these days carnivorous? Uh, of course, ants are on a very technical level wasps, 
but my understanding is that they were already ants essentially before that uh, as that mutualism developed. You can take a look at The Leafcutter Ants, which is a book by uh, Bert Holdobler and E.O. Wilson, if you're more interested, if you're interested in learning more uh, about fungus growing ants and how things worked. It, that is an example of something that has evolved convergently, which is essentially like it has evolved independently within different ant groups. So it's not just one, um, uh, one common ancestor, it actually has evolved a number of times. Okay, I'm going to take a look, see if I can get some other questions here. Somebody said, you, uh, something said, you mentioned something about ants learning how to hunt fruit flies. If that generation completely dies off, will they still remember or have an idea to, of how to hunt them? No, the ants that have learned how to hunt them uh, wouldn't hold an instructional seminar. Uh, there's no Zoom calls. Uh, there's no, no classes in the nest uh, on how to do things that they've already done outside. That being said, usually there's a mix of ants of either you know different generations, different ages, that sort of thing that go uh, hunting or foraging. So if that behavior continues without being um, interrupted for a very long amount of time, uh, there's always going to be some ants around who essentially have practiced and, and understand how to attack uh, something like a fruit fly. Um, but no, uh, if a generation dies off and they haven't, the, the other ants haven't been exposed to that behavior or anything, they're not going to transfer the knowledge. That, that knowledge is not something they can communicate. Okay, let's see if we can find another question. And as a, as a reminder, uh, this is general Q&A. This can be about ant keeping. It can be about myrmecology, what science is like, uh, experiences like that, of course. Do ants slow and become weaker as they age? Uh, there might be situations where that happens, but for the most part, uh, an ant, once it is born or ecloses is going to have about the same capabilities uh, as an ant prior to its death. That being said, uh, the oldest ants in the colony, they might have missing limbs from battles they've had. Um, they <laughs> There's lots of different ways that ailments can affect how they move. But if you're taking like an ant within a captive colony that's never really been through anything, they're going to have about the same capabilities as um, you know, the, the, the ants right when they eat clothes. Um, Mr. I Love the Ants asks, how do ants respond to forest fires during both the blaze and the regrowth afterward? That's a fantastic question. It's one of those questions that I personally have uh, thought about trying to study, and at some point in my career, maybe I will. I don't think it's been studied in great depth. Um, we know that ants will react to adverse conditions by trying to get away from it. So uh, ground nesting ants definitely have an advantage here where they can descend down into the soil layers where that heat from the fires doesn't necessarily penetrate. However, uh, that's only part of the equation, right? That's during the blaze and right after. That regrowth period as the uh, new plants uh, take root, the ecosystem it changes dramatically, of course, pre from pre-fire to post-fire. Uh, and the ants that survive in that new environment generally are going to be the kind of generalists that will take lots of food from uh, you know, different sources. They're not uh, relying on a very specific aphid species in a specific tree that might have burned, that kind of thing. Um, that being said, one of the things that tends to help likely with repopulating areas is that because there are new queens starting small colonies often in the ground, even if they're wood dwelling species, uh, that offers them uh, an opportunity to build a new colony in an area that might have had large colonies of that same species. So for example, you might have Campanotus modoc here in Idaho, for example, where 
uh, you might have large colonies spread throughout the forest. But a forest fire comes through, kills off all the large colonies that were in the logs or the standing trees. And then you have the small colonies that are sometimes started under rocks. And those rocks, being insulators, uh, might have kept the uh, heat away long enough for them to survive. Uh, I can go on and on about our different ideas about it, but it's not something that's super well studied. And it's definitely interesting and an important thing for us to learn more about in the future. Um, as a general reminder, <laughs> the forest fires that we're seeing here in the Western United States are compounded by poor forest management and climate change. So this is going to be an increasing problem, and it is actually one of the things that threatens ant species around the world because humans have changed the environment in such a way that now we lose vast swaths of forest and the succession that happens in those forests is different than it, ha than it is when it's natural. Um, so we have to monitor for that. We could very well lose ant species due to habitat loss and things like climate change and forest fires over the next hundred years. Okay, let's see. Uh, given the time, I'm gonna take one more question. Uh, Mike from New York asks, if an individual queen is more aggressive or docile, will the behavior of the queen influence the workers in the way that some social bees do? That's a great question. Now, anecdotally, I can tell you that some of the, the queens that seem more docile and have workers that are more docile uh, in captivity definitely have a, a strong contrast compared to the um, more aggressive or more uh, kind of outgoing ants, right? So maybe you put a food source in, in uh, the formicarium and ants of one colony are a little jumpier. <laughs> They're more likely to, to react uh, to that, whereas others may be more docile. They're just gonna run back to the queen and hang out by her. So there is behavioral differences within ant species uh, that we have seen for sure. Now that behavior, because behavior in ants is almost entirely governed by genetics, is certainly something that can come from the queen and, and kind of the behavioral predispositions that she has. Okay, folks, I'm going to continue moving on. I'm sorry that I don't have more time for you, but I have a few things I want to share with you folks. Um, important to note that diapause is coming. <laughs> you need to be prepared for that. Uh, and if you have specific questions about diapause, uh, you can ask that in the in the chat, of course, here on Discord. I think I gave an AMA where we covered diapause as well. Uh, but just be prepared, be aware that that is um, something that's that's happening. Uh, a couple of community notes. I think it's really important to remind everybody that how we interact with each other online has a huge impact not only on the people we're interacting with, but the community itself. Um, unfortunately, I've seen some negative interactions as of late, and I think we just need to make sure that as a community, we are doing our very best, not only to be welcoming, but to uh, have effective outreach and, and to work on growing the hobby because we all benefit from doing that. There's also been a huge resurgence of copycat formicaria. And these are people who are trying to undermine the folks who have dedicated their livelihoods to creating ant products. And oftentimes these are like Chinese copycats who have stolen US intellectual property, that kind of stuff. Um, as a community, we have a responsibility to, to support the people who are operating ethically. And I just want to remind you that when you're making buying decisions, that should be a factor. Um, I and other senior members of the community definitely um, encourage you to consider that. And we expect you to be the best possible community members that you can be. And that's one area that we've seen growth of unethical uh, behavior as of late is that copycat formicaria issue. So uh, I don't wanna lecture you on it, but I want you to be aware of it and mindful of how it impacts our ability to be ant keepers, to provide high quality products. All of that is impacted by that unethical uh, yep. behavior. Yeah. Uh, now I wanna talk about, oh, sorry. <laughs> 
No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I can talk about it later. Sure. Uh, so now I just want to say a couple things about the Ant Network. The Ant Network is going full bore. Uh, this is my, my full-time focus right now, is creating uh, video content for you guys. It's working on the museum and zoo exhibits and displays that we work on. Um, and we're always looking for ways to better serve ant keepers and the community. So if you have ideas, please let us know. We are looking for donations. If you want to support the work that we do and help us uh, create more content more often, uh, that's one of the ways that you can absolutely help us do that. We do have some new episodes of the Ant Explorer. They are imminent. Uh, we're working on that quite, quite hard, and I'm excited to share that with you soon. Uh, and then watch uh, over the next couple of weeks. We'll be having a new website launch, and we'll also be launching some more products this fall. Great. So if you're interested in the Ant Network, uh, follow us over on Instagram. We've also got our YouTube channel. If you don't know about the Ant Network, please do check it out. And then if you're interested in setting up custom displays for ants, that is one of our specialties. Um, we don't create standalone formicaria for uh, just personal use, but if you want to have a really nice custom display, you know of a museum or a science center that you think should have an ant display, please let us know. And uh, you're, feel free to message me about that. So that's all I've got for you today. Um, and I'll hand it back over to Sol. Okay, great. Um... That was really informative. Uh, I, there, I actually, I had, I had one question. Um, so, the, I've, I've seen examples of like beetles and stuff that that live with army ants um, as they move around. Are there any uh, mutualistic insects that aren't really seen in the hobby that you would suggest? Um, so, mutualistic insects that uh, interact with ants mm -hmm. is that specific? Um, of course, you have the classic ants and aphids, and that's one yeah. thing that hobbyists have been able to do. You see ants and mealybugs uh, far less frequently. Root aphids is an issue that we haven't really solved and should absolutely be um, a priority for ant keepers to figure out how yeah. to keep root aphids yeah. with ants, aside from just in a bucket of dirt. Okay, we're talking a little bit more sophisticated. You also have the cockroaches that live within leafcutter ant nests, even at a Texana. Uh, so finding those, finding queens with those cockroaches, that would be a fascinating thing to do. I have kept ant crickets, which is Myrmecophilus species in nests. My friend and fellow researcher, Christina Quapich, has done that as well. But that's something that if you find those, those mutualistic or uh, at the very least inquiline uh, insects out in colonies or in nature, keeping them in captivity, watching that uh, and observing their behavior. That's something that can be very interesting as well. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. And uh, I'm sure everybody really loved it. Uh, uh, everybody else, um, the AMA has been recorded and should be up within an hour or so. Uh, Miles will, I, you have a video recording going, right? That is correct. Um, although I just ended it. Okay. Uh, just a second.